Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the great unsung master of the classical period. I'm referring to Luigi Boccherini, one of the geniuses of the second half of the 18th century. He lived from around 1743 to 1805. Most people aren't even aware that he existed still in 1805. He's usually, he's usually treated as a sort of precursor to Haydn and Mozart. He was contemptuously referred to in his life as the wife of Haydn because he was a composer of very, very, very different character. Apparently, they knew each other and got along rather well, or at least had some correspondence and respected each other. That is Haydn and Boccherini. But the reasons that Boccherini has never gotten the attention he deserved are, are many and have absolutely nothing to do with his music. He is the greatest musical character ever to come out of the Italian town of Lucca in Tuscany before Puccini. That's strike number one, that he came from the same town as Puccini. And usually when that happens, there's only room for one famous guy from your town, and Puccini is the guy, not Boccherini. And of course, Puccini wrote operas, and he's got singers running around doing everything, and, you know, he didn't write. Boccherini never wrote O Mio Babino Caro. I mean, it's a problem. It's a problem. The other thing is that Boccherini was a composer almost entirely of instrumental music and beyond that, chamber music. In other words, his music was was conceived for a kind of musical culture that really no longer exists. That is music making in aristocratic homes among very talented amateur and professional musicians. Now, with recordings, that shouldn't make any difference. But the problem with recording Boccherini is that even though almost all of his music was published in his lifetime, it was published in France for the most part, uh, he does not have a modern critical edition. That is being remedied very, very slowly. But along with the critical edition of C.P.E. Bach, which is nearing completion, I can't think of any two composers who are more important and who need to be served by modern editions of his music, which will allow it to be performed and recorded. The C.P.E. Bach edition is being undertaken by the, the Packard Humanities Institute, the Boccherini edition, which will be proceeding much more slowly for various reasons, is being undertaken by the edition Opera Omnia Luigi Boccherini in Luca. I have some samples here, just so you can see. Here is one of the, the volumes. These are the Boccherini string trios, Opus 1. Um, which is very nice to have. And then they very smartly did the Stabat Mater, both versions of it. You know, Boccherini wrote it twice, um, and once for a single soloist, once for two soloists, several years later. And both editions have been published by the Boccherini Complete Edition now. The publisher is Ut Orpheus in Italy. Um, and these are beautiful, beautifully made editions. And most happily, they have done the guitar quintets, because boy, are those things coming out on disc everywhere. Every guitarist in the world wants to do the guitar quintets because after all, there is a dearth of great classical music for the guitar. And these are among the greatest works written um, for that medium. Here they are. This is this is the variations on on the, the Retrata de Madrid, one of the most famous pieces that Boccherini wrote that we still care about. We should care about much more, but I'm just, you know, pointing out. So all of this stuff is starting to come out and it's very exciting. And one of the reasons I mentioned it is shamelessly self-promoting as I am. And I just whacked my gong here a little bit is that I have been had the great honor to be associated with the publication of the Boccherini Complete Edition. I've been doing copy editing work. Um, for, for, you know, and checking out some of the English language stuff and the prefaces and the, and the Revisionsberichte and whatnot. It's been a, a tremendous pleasure for me. And I have to say, the people who are responsible for the Boccherini Complete Edition are probably the most lovely human beings that ever existed on this earth. And it's, it's just a delight to be able to work with them. So, I, you know, I have a personal investment in seeing that Boccherini's music sees the light of day. It's so, so, so important. 
important that it does. What did he actually compose? Let's talk about it for a second, the kind of composer he was. He wrote about 140 some odd string quintets, most with two cellos, some with two violas. He wrote over 100 string quartets. He wrote every kind of chamber music that you can imagine. He wrote trios, he wrote duos, he wrote quintets and sextets, and, and uh, there, there's just tons and tons and tons of stuff. He wrote very little vocal music. There are three sort of dramatic works. Um, one is an opera called La Clementina, which I have sitting up there. That's been published in the critical edition. There are, it's actually billed as a zarzuela before the romantic notion of zarzuela became, became current. There are, as there's a volume of concert arias. There's the Stabat Mater. There's a cantata, the rape of the Sabine women. Um, and that's really about it. There's very little else. Almost all of his music is instrumental. And as with Haydn, that tends to count against him because it, it slows the dissemination of his music and limits the audience for it to people who, as I said, are interested in chamber music, which is a niche of a niche. Um, and the, the other issue is that he was an instrumental music composer who, who was Italian. And throughout our, our nasty, miserable, elitist Western musicological culture, you know, the people who generally invented musicology and promoted their music that was instrumental were German. And they sneer on Italian music and they sneer on Boccherini. You know that Boccherini never gets the attention he deserves as a serious composer and master of instrumental music because he did not write in what were later categorized always as sonata forms. I mean, he used something like that, but they weren't, they weren't typical. His forms are freer and more unusual. His handling of texture is different. And that brings up the last issue, which is the kind of composer that he was. Do you remember, you know, one of my talks, uh, you know, Jed and I, my, my, my colleague Jed Disler always talk about composers and conductors being divided into two categories, chord guys and line guys. Line guys are interested in counterpoint. They do counterpoint. They don't think orchestral color or instrumental color is as important. And, and that idea of, of sheer color and texture is subordinated to the, the, the contrapuntal line, the multi-voiced writing for orchestra. And then there are chord guys. Chord guys, it's not a question of simplicity of, of texture because often chord guys' textures are much more complex than contrapuntal textures. Contrapuntal textures may be limited to just a couple of voices. Chord guys are interested in sound. They're interested in the sound of, that music makes and keeping it as, as seductive and interesting and kaleidoscopic as possible. I mean, the ultimate chord guy conductor was Leopold Stokowski, for example. He always was playing with the sound of the orchestra. He wanted the richest, most saturated sounds at all times. You know, creaky old German conductors and Bruckner guys are usually line guys. You know, they like counterpoint. But, but Boccherini was, for the classical period, the ultimate chord guy. He had an ear that was absolutely the most sensitive, and his music shows that. And to that extent, he's harder to listen to than, for example, Haydn and Mozart, because his music tends to be more leisurely. It doesn't mean it doesn't have muscle. It doesn't have interest or tension. It does. But, but he's concerned with making the most exquisite, shaded, sensuous, and various sounds that he could make, usually with very small ensembles. That means, for example, he sounds horrible most of the time when played on period instruments with their more limited coloristic range, shall we say, or at least modern concept of what period sound is, which has a more limited coloristic range. It may not have been true in Boccherini's day after all. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you what I mean by Boccherini being a chord guy. He makes more demands on the listener because you have to really listen carefully. His scores are incredibly detailed. They have lots of expressive indications, lots of dynamic indications, shadings from pianissimo to piano, wonderful use of Italian language. One of his favorite Favorite terms is amoroso, lovingly, or suave, which is, of course, suave, but soft and 
sexy. That's what his music is. His most popular work, you know, that still survives, that people have always listened to, is that little minuet. The minuet comes from the, the string quintet in E, um, which is uh, Opus 13, number five. Nobody plays the whole quintet ever. It's gorgeous. The first movement is marked Amoroso. But the minuet is a lovely, lovely piece, and I'm going to play it for you, just the tune, to give you a sense of it. And then we're going to talk about that tune for a second, and it'll, it will explain to you what I mean exactly. I'm just going to hold up uh, something here so you can stare at the Boccherini edition while we play it. Listen to the minuet. That was Naxos recording of the minuet, which was, comes coupled with uh, the guitar quintets. We're going to talk about those in a future chat. Trust me, don't worry. We're going to do a lot of Boccherini. But that was the minuet. Now, let's take it apart and and be clear on what we're actually listening to. It was It's a quintet for, for uh, two violins, viola, and two cellos. The tune is as simple as can be. It's very pretty. Everybody treats it as sort of the apotheosis of fluffy Rococo sweetness, you know, that we don't have to pay much attention to. But the amount of craft that went into that simple melody is really staggering. Let me let me let me tell you something about that little tune. First of all, the first violin is muted. Muted violins, Bach already composed this thing in the early 1770s. That was not such a common thing for solo violins and chamber music, but Boccherini wanted to have the maximum variety of sound and texture. So the first violin is muted that gives, gives that tune that soft, fuzzy sound. But it's not a weak, weak jointed tune. In fact, the syncopations tell us that it really isn't a danceable minuet at all. I mean, minuets are in three, four, right? One, two, three. But the tune is written so that the, the beats, the beat accents occur on the off beats. So here, let me tap out the rhythm and I'm going to whistle the tune. I know it's going to sound horrible, but you'll see what I mean. So here's the rhythm. One, two, three. And here's the tune. See what I mean? The actual notes of the melody are not occurring <laughs> where my hands are clapping. What does that do? The idea of having a melody that's offbeat with an accompaniment that's squarely on beat gives the music an inner tension that forces you to listen. It, it, it makes you hear the music as it moves forward. But let's talk for a minute now about the accompaniment. The three lower strings, that is the two cellos and the viola, are all playing pizzicato, you know, plucking, which gives it that lovely harp or guitar strumming kind of sound. The second violin has an accompaniment using a technique called bariolage, which is a rapid alternating between two notes back and forth. It's going wah, 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 wah. It's almost inaudible, but if you listen, especially to the second limb of that melody, you'll hear it pretty clearly. It's there in the background. It's actually a very difficult accompaniment because it involves what they call in the string business, string crossings. That is the, 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 the notes chosen and the distance between them requires the player to leap across you know, there are four strings and you don't always, you don't always get to play them in order of increasing size. You have to jump between them while you very carefully keep that accompaniment rhythmically even. So there's an awful lot of thought in just this little melody and the accompanying texture. Thought in how it sounds in the texture that Boccherini creates. And so now I want you to listen to it again with all of that in mind, the muted first violins, the bariolage accompaniment on the second violin, the pizzicato below, 
all of these, the syncopations in the melody, listen to it now, knowing what you do about how, how carefully and how precisely Boccherini has scored that simple melody. Just listen to it again now. So you understand what I'm trying to get at. Boccherini's music requires that kind of care and attention of the listener, and that takes a certain amount of effort. You can't ignore him. There's a temptation to. His music has been ignored. It's been treated as music that's supposed to be ignored. But if you pay attention, you're going to hear the most amazingly exquisite artistic sensibility at work. He's almost like the Richard Strauss of the classical period in that sense. So he just loves sound, rich, beautiful sounds. And, you know, I mean, and there's a lot of music. I said for 500 pieces, that are, aside from the chamber music, there's 30 symphonies. We're going to talk about all of this stuff, all of this stuff. And it's, it's absolutely marvelous. And I'm going to give you as a way of kind of wrapping up this little chat, with some samples or recording that I think is the best way to get started listening to Boccherini, giving a sense of what he's all about and what he does. And that is this absolutely fabulous disc on CPO featuring the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra under Johannes Goritsky. Now, I've, as I've said, one of the problems we're going to be having with Boccherini is that a lot of period instrument ensembles are going to get their claws on him because he's getting published now, and we have to be awfully careful. Boccherini's notation is incredibly precise, number one. Number two, he's a vibrato guy. He often writes down when to use it because he wanted a warm singing tone. And most of our period instrument groups do not like warm singing tones and aren't very good at them and ignore vibrato for that reason, which I which is, is maddening because the notation is right there and what it means is really pretty clear and it's often misread and misinterpreted. There is a series, for example, of string quintets performed by a group called you know, La Magnifica Comunita. The, I mean, these period groups have these dumb names, the Magnificent Community. You know, I would call them the dysfunctional chain gang, <laughs> you know, because that's what their music making sounds like. They're on brilliant classics. It's really a shame because, I mean, they're, they're good players, but the kind of sound that they make is so wrong for this music. In a sense, Boccherini's music is really made for modern instruments and modern players with their shadings of color and the, and the ability to really sing. And I suspect that's what Boccherini did. And that's what happens happily in these marvelous performances with Johannes Goritsky. Now, on this disc, you get the symphony, now Boccherini, you know, has G numbers, you know, like, Mer like Mozart has K numbers and Haydn has Hoboken and Bach has BWV, Boccherini has G. And it's handy to know what those are because there's a lot of music and it was never numbered quite the way that, that uh, some of these other composers have been numbered because his music was so neglected. He had opus numbers quite often that had to do with how his music was published. But today we usually use G numbers or opus numbers. So this disc contains a symphony, G521, but this is just not really a symphony. It's an overture, a three movement in one Italian Sinfonia in fast, slow, fast time. It's only a bit over five minutes long. It's lovely. What makes Boccherini's texture so lovely is the, is the heavily divided string textures. I mean, he used divided strings constantly, even in tiny, tiny works, to create the maximum sensuousness and fullness of sound, and he achieved it. It's marvelous, just marvelous. So you get a symphony, you get two cello concertos, he wrote about a dozen of those, and my favorite of all, you get this octet. It's from his Opus 38. This is Opus 38 number four. The G number is 470. 
This octet is a marvel of colorful melody and sonority. I can't get over this octet. It blows my mind every time I hear it. It is so charming. It's the essence of what charm ought to be. It's, it's, it's just an incredible, incredible piece. The octet is written for a string quintet, the Boccherini quintet, type quintet with two cellos in the string section, a flute alternating on an oboe, a bassoon, and a horn. That's it. I first thought it was an orchestral work. The sound is that full and that euphonious. And I'm going to play you the opening of the octet. You've just got to hear this thing. It is incredible. Take a listen. just just make you happy <laughs> it makes you smile it's it's beautiful listen to this handling of the instruments it's so so wonderful now that octet has been recorded before it was recorded um you know on vivarte on period instruments with Anna Bilsma I think was the cellist it, it, it not as well it, not as well it's sort of a hasty not as you know, you, you have to play his music with amoroso, with love, with warmth, with 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 that singing sensuous sound like these players do here. It's great. And I also want to play you a bit of one of these cello concertos. As I said, there are a dozen of them. The only Boccherini cello concerto that we've ever known is, you know which one. There's a famous Boccherini cello concerto. It gets coupled to Haydn cello concertos. It's a coupling for something. You know, it's a throwaway piece in a modern bodlerization of what Boccherini really wrote. You have to hear it the way he wrote it. Listen to, to and this is uh, Goretzky, who is the cellist and the conductor, play the Slovum. This is the adagio of the cello concerto in D major. This is G479. I, this is not what you may call, I mean, these are early works. This is the, you know, we're talking, we're talking the, the 1770s here. This is romantic music. That's what this is. I'm serious. Listen to listen to this. It's gorgeous. Doesn't it make you want to run out and tell your neighbors and haul them in and sit them down and make them listen? But you have to listen. Listen just to the way. Listen to the way that the 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 the, the cello is doubled by the other strings. I mean, just the way that melody is spun out. I'm going to play it for you again. It's that beautiful. Listen to it again. what I mean by Boccherini. You have to listen to it again. You have to take time and let it soak in and strike you. It is amazing. Boccherini's symphonies were championed, by the way, 
by my, my friend, the late conductor Antonio de Almeida, who was very funny. He was involved in, in preparing a critical edition of them for, I think it was Doblinger. And he wanted desperately to record them, desperately. So he refused to finish the critical edition. They had to get someone else to do it after he died. He held on to it because he was waiting. He wanted to have one that he was keeping in reserve so that no one else could get a chance to make the record. Sadly, he never did. But he always, we used to fight over it because I used to think that Boccherini was, you know, the wife of Haydn, just this sort of pale shadow of what a classical composer could be. And he always said to me, no, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You have to listen to it. And it's so easy. It's so easy for all of us to dismiss music that we haven't heard or don't give time, the time it needs, the time it deserves. And, you know, Boccherini is one of those composers. He's one of those composers. He needs a little time. He needs a little attention. But my God, he rewards it if you give it to him. And Antonio de Almeida knew that. He knew that because he listened. So the lesson, the lesson always is that we must always keep on listening. And if we do, the rewards will be immense. Nowhere more so than in the music of Luigi Boccherini. Give him a chance. We're going to talk about it, and hopefully this will help you on your way. He's a master, just a master. It's it's going to be a miracle of musical discovery. I guarantee it. Thank you. Take care.